We're leaving tomorrow to go to Korea and start boot camping there. We already have a lot planned out. Scrim partners, what we're gonna do, everything. We are going to Korea with a plan and we're gonna boot camp hard and hopefully come to the world extremely prepared. Welcome back to our continuing coverage of the 2014 Summer Playoff Championship. Before we head back onto the Rift, we want to see what you've been tweeting in response to our question of the day. Now, to remind you, earlier in the show, we asked, what has been your favorite moment from this week? And there were a ton of awesome responses, and it was really, really tough to narrow it down, but we did it. And our first response comes from at Jonah X. All right. uh, my favorite moment from, uh, from the week was watching LMQ go big in every team fight, not scared to dive anywhere, anytime. Uh, yeah, that's kind of characteristic of their play style, you know. They're always looking for fights, 3v3s, like around dragon and around buffs. So yeah, they always have very high kill games. And they did it all after starting a series 0-2, which, you know, that takes a lot of confidence. Our second one comes from at Peru C. Mantaraya Fest featuring Freak, best moment of the week. Man, Freak has great moments all the time. Mantaraya! There it is. Really into that one. You're much better at rolling your R's than I am. <laughs> Our third one comes from at... Ethan Bachman, the maturity of Team Curse's players after yesterday, still meeting fans takes a lot of heart after all that. Uh, yeah, as a player that's accustomed to losing a lot, uh, <laughs> going outside to talk to the fans can be really uh, kind of comforting, I guess, because they'll still support you whether you win or you lose. Uh, it, and I know a lot of pro players share that opinion. It's got to be nice to have that affirmation of support from all of your fans. And then our final tweet, at xzionic. Favorite moment? Rito, please. This whole week has been phenomenal. It would do an injustice to the week if only one moment was picked. Wow, that was 140 characters? It's impressive. My favorite moment of the week was having that tweet read to me. That was <laughs> very lovely. Thank you. Well, if you're not already, be sure to follow us at Lolly Sports and to join the conversation, use the hashtag LCS. Now, the 3,000 fans in attendance at PAX Prime aren't the only ones glued to the action right now. We'll be checking in with this viewing party at Seattle's Pine Box throughout the afternoon. A few fans washing down the heat from the rift with a cold one. Looks like a pretty good time. Oh, yeah. I wish I was there right there. There's an empty seat to the left of that guy. That's for you. It's, I believe that seat's reserved for you, Zyrene. That's where I'm going, right after this. <laughs> I like it. Well, now returning back to the business at hand, game three of our summer playoff finals. TSM coming out like a team transformed in game two to even up the series at 1-1. Yeah, and I really think that TSM, that was a huge surge of confidence for them because they just took their first game off Cloud9 in playoffs ever. That's got to be just a huge boon. They got to be feeling really high right now. Yeah, and then over on the side of Cloud9, what do they do to retake control of the series? I feel like, in particular, High made some uncharacteristic mistakes. Um, yeah, he did end up giving like so many deaths that game, but really it's just because of the champion pick into what the enemies had. You know, like Yasuo versus Alistar and Syndra, like I said earlier, is pretty much suicide. So I think if they just get rid of those two champions, which should be banned every game, between those two teams, and he'll have a much better showing than he did this game. All right, speaking of bans, I do think that the Lee Sin ban, tailed that off at the end, needs to be just thrown away, because amazing, he performs a little bit better on Elise, but I think that the Syndra ban needs to come through in place of the Lee Sin. So it all starts in Champion Select. We're going to toss it right over to the guys at the caster desk to get us into it. Thank you very much, Dash. We are ready, the fans are ready, and I'm sure the players are ready as well. We're about to jump into Champion Select in just a little bit for Game 3, and that means the Team Solo Mid came back in Game 2. If you didn't see it, it was quite extravagant. Cloud9 actually almost took it themselves. For just a quick summary, and then TSM wins the game. So now on to Game 3. Analyst Desk is saying the Cinder needs to be banned out. That's actually what was said a lot in a lot of Team Solo Mids games, especially when they played Dig. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they banned it in the first game. So yep, they, they did. And now they have blue side, so they have a bit more flexibility as far as pick and ban is concerned yep. for Cloud9. So I wouldn't be too surprised if we ended up seeing that. We saw that the Lucian versus Triss thing right there, the early lane and turret yep. push of the Lucian was really strong there for TSM early on. And even though the Alistair didn't get much done early game, right. it was still quite a presence in team fights. My favorite thing about that game is it was not a regular start. Both teams had to adapt, both teams had to react, and they did it in astounding ways. And we haven't really seen TSM try to take control of a game that early when something bad happened to them. And then they kind of just shut down the turrets for Cloud9. Yeah, when I was watching it, it seemed like TSM had kind of lost their mind. They were defaulting back to this two people in the jungle, four man turret dive. But if I think about it a little bit more uh, after the game, yeah. that style was when Cloud9 was at their worst by far. 
when everyone was doing the 2v0s and Meteos had to share jungle, Cloud9 was not winning any games. That's when they were losing all the games to complexity. That's when they were sitting around third or fourth in the standings. Right. And TSM kind of tried to create that game because they play them so many times yeah. in standard lanes and Cloud9 will win again and again. So what do you do? You change the way the game is played. And that was yep. one of the big reasons TSM could win. And you can see in Cloud9's play, they don't send anybody with Meteos. They still try to adapt mm -hmm. to that and they send the support down to the top laner who is then in the bottom lane. So getting that mix up has actually seemed to be quite good for Team Solomon. We'll see if they can do it again. As we said, Cloud9 back on blue for picks and bans where they can strike to the heart of Team Solomon with the first pick here. Nunu ban and Nidalee ban. No one wants balls on that Nidalee. Uh, Lee Sin ban for Amazing. I wonder if that last ban will be the Syndra or not. If your team's solo mid here, I feel like they try and leave a lot of stuff up and take things on the backside. This, yeah. this series is going to be full of mind games. I actually really love the way these North American playoffs have been playing out because it seems like instead of cycling through you know, six to eight different bands, we're cycling through like 12 to 15 different yeah. bands. And the pick and ban just seems unique in every matchup and every game. Once it goes through, we talked about Cloud9 not minding to play against those high tier plays or high tier champions. Zed. For their chosen. Of course. And it looks like Zed does get picked up, so Cloud9 gets what they want and they get the Cinder ban. So High's going to have fun in the mid lane. We'll see if they actually revolve a team around something that he can continuously take blue and keep himself leveled. Lustboy gets his Nami this time, and Lulu does get locked in for Dyrus. Having the Nami will be a nice feeling of security there mm -hmm. for Lost Boy, but I really wish TSM would have banned Zed. <laughs> They're obviously more afraid of either the top lane presence of Alistair and Nidalee or the support presence of Azillion because all those things have their greatest strengths, but I just see the difference between high in game one and high in game two. When he's on Zed and comfortable, or when he's getting pressured hard by Syndra and on Yasuo, and the entire team performance of Cloud9 differs from that. Yeah. High is very good at Zed, and Cloud9 rarely loses when he has that champion. Hopefully, they can keep him off a three-minute first blood on Dyrus. Walls yeah, down that's the step one, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, he is going to wreak havoc in the mid lane. Bjergsen knows he's going to have a tough time already, and it's going to be the Braum lock-in as well. That will be a tidal wave crashing into a shield. Wild Turtle for the first time in the playoffs here against Cloud9 to take Trist away from Sneaky. Will he decide to lock that in? He loves to build just the damage up on Lucian, mm -hmm. but he does take it away. Yeah, I wonder if Sneaky's gonna answer with Kogma or with Lucian because Cloud9 is one of the teams that is actually very good at Kog. And Sneaky, there was a one point in the Curse series where he just straight up 1v2'd and killed the support <laughs> on Kog, like in the middle of the lane. Yep. So it's quite threatening. With Braum though, not as aggressive of a combination. Might want the Lucian for the LeBron lane. Right. We'll see. Those passive shots off on concussive blows after Winter's yep. Bite is always something to be reckoned with in the bottom lane. It's kind of like knowing you're going to get hit by power cords. It's eventually going to happen. <laughs> nice. Locking in the Maokai. They still get something they want in, in a top tier choice for balls. And that Kog'Maw is, in fact, locked in. It's a very powerful looking composition there for Cloud9. A very strong front line with which to protect Sneaky with. Yeah. And now TSM is in that situation again where they are wondering to go with the Fizz or with Xerath, I would have to say, are the two things they'd be picking between. Ori is also pretty good against Zed, but based on their track record of pick and ban, this event during these NA playoffs, I think it's between the Xerath and the Fizz. Definitely a lot of discussion going down about it. Ori, though, yeah. Ori will be locked in. Bjergsen was able to wreak some havoc with that in previous games. He usually wins the lane with that choice. Mm -hmm. Bjergsen very strong with the utility of Oriana. We'll see what happens. I like the protect composition. A lot of shields, a lot of everything to go around into Bjergsen. Or Bjergsen, yeah, he has Kha'Zix into Amazing really when do. he jumps yeah. in. But that's got to be that big initiation. Everything else is pretty much disengaged for them. It's crazy. And it's also incredibly close to the protect the Tristana composition they ran in round one of the playoffs against Dignitas. The yeah. only difference is that they had a Nunu jungle then instead of a Kha'Zix. But the Ori shield, the Lulu shield, and, and help picks damage as well as the Nami E will all be adding to the Trist damage. So yep. 
it's very important that Hai can get on the right targets to assassinate, but the assassination is hard when they have that many shields. Uh, much more yeah. dynamic and more synergy with the shielding in this TSM composition than when they had the Zillion Lulu, because everything can just pile on to try and make stuff unkillable. Very excited to see what happens as we go into game three. While the teams are loading, head over to Twitter and keep your voting coming. Tweet hashtag C9win or TSMwin to at LOL Esports. We'll be checking back shortly to see where the votes stand. Right now, we stand going into a game three, and this momentum could really start to tilt the tables in someone's favor. It's obviously going to be a win, but that momentum we've seen it already carry to just the two games that are now consecutively needed to get that win. Yeah, and you never know when the series is going to swing back. We've seen all kinds of the best of fives here. Cloud9 has not been tested like this in the North American playoffs. However, they had their most testing split they've ever had, so they do know how to bounce back from losses, ending the regular season on such a hot streak. But TSM really had that emotional Game 5 win, kind of proving to themselves that they can fight their way through a best of five. Hey, man, everything's a scrim. Yeah, everything's, everything's a scrim. scrim. Everything's they, a scrim. they crush Cloud9 in scrims, but... You, Cloud9 here is a completely different animal. They've proven that time and again. Absolutely. We're about to head on to the rift. Let's get it on the screen. This time it's going to be Cloud9 on the blue side. TSM coming from the red. Let's see if that changes anything up. We saw TSM's wing coming off of blue last time. That first pick priority has been a big boon for these teams. And this time it was Zed once again for high. Focus on him for the mid lane. We'll be watching Bjergsen as well. That's quite a lane to really have an effect on these games. Long sword start for him. Interesting. Probably just extra health potions wanted for all the harass Bjergsen put on him. As well, TSM with much more defensive summoner spell choices than they had in the first game against Zed. They actually do bring Exhaust this time. Uh, Lust Boy locking that one in, or as compared to last game mm -hmm. as well. Uh, Bjergsen as well with Barrier to try and I stop like assassinations. I wonder if that actually signals that Bjergsen will not be going for Zhonya's early. It gives him a little bit more individual defense. Normally that's why you build the Zhonyas. Uh, he can do any which way he wants, though. He's already had success with a tier start Ori yep. during this pack, so he has plenty of options. Just a little bit of back and forth as usual. Nobody wanted to give up too much in this early game. TSM is going to actually get quite a nice red ward in there, so knowing the exact time of movement here, the Meteos, or rather the start that he's going to have. Mm -hmm. Definitely a slight change up in early game strats. However, the deep wards that were placed were spotted. Cloud9's ward on the red buff is inferred for TSM because they saw them running out. And then when they saw them running out, Cloud9 could infer that a ward got placed on their own red because that's, yeah. TSM would have had nothing to worry about running into Cloud9's jungle at that time. Vision is power, man. It's going to keep you safe. So far, it's already got Cloud9 that first kill on Dyrus in the first game. So keep away from that. A lot of help here coming in from Eidos on this first buff. Well, Cloud9 trying to keep it simple right here. They have the Kog'Maw on the top lane, but I wonder how much sharing they're going to do. I think they were just trying to guarantee the right lanes. Uh, it's not like they're double jungling or anything. Yeah, Alkine right. and Rom slowly running down to that bottom lane to try and get some farm. So again, it's going to be the struggle for Maokai and Braum to try and farm against an AD carry and support. That looks like it'd be fun, really. Yeah, and also in the top lane here, uh, with a Kog'Maw in a solo long lane, mm -hmm. the vulnerability to ganks is much greater than when he was solo laning Trist. We'll have to see if TSM tries to exploit that. Medios may have to spend some babysitting time towards the top side of the jungle. Right now, both junglers on their reds may get a beating some sort after they hit one more camp Wolf Wraith. Too bad on the ring around for both of these guys. Medios actually passing right over that so he can be towards the top side of the map if anything does go down for Sneaky. So very good play by him. Also wants to get some early vision out. Well, Dyrus should be on the defensive here. Yeah. Knowing what happened in the first game. Meteos, though, taking a very inefficient route to the top lane. So right now, Dyrus doesn't expect an early gank because uh, he knows Meteos started blue since they had a ward on the red. And now that he's approaching here, he's went directly towards him. So it's almost overly defensive play from Dyrus if he doesn't 
put himself in gank position. The wave is just not in a very good spot, and yep. Meteo sees no approach. Dyrus is playing more defensively because he knows Cloud9 is Very nicely done there. The homework pays off. Meteo is forced back to his jungle. Only four minutes in here, so Dyrus staves off that first blood. Nobody has gone down. Both teams playing really for the win situation. Usually when you come into the best of five, they play to the, I don't want to lose. So it's very passive, but neither of these teams have really given up an inch. They always want here under the turret, Wild Turtle and Lust Boy already start forcing balls down. He gets a bit of what he wants. Going to go back for some potions and head back to lane. Mm. So pretty standard early game, actually. Yep. As standard lanes as we're probably going to end up getting <laughs> in this best of five, just because Cloud9 had that uh, micro meta that I like to call it in scrims where they would put the solo AD carry early game so he could gain a level advantage and then try and hyper carry the game. This is all about not only securing farm for the AD carry, but securing level so that when he matches up against the other AD carry, he can outmatch him. That's gonna but this is, the, this is the vulnerability to ganks right here. Ooh. If Amazing would have went, would have gone straight through there, uh, right over top of the ward, Sneaky would have either burned his flash but because he kind of second-guessed his, yeah. his gank, it ends up just tipping him off. Well, he does get some wards down. He's holding his pink. He doesn't decide to put that down just yet. Maybe he wants to get down below where high is so they make sure there's no roam down from him as well. Definitely a kill lane if they were to get a gank in the bottom between those two. A lot of crowd control to be had there. The Lost Boy's keeping Wild Turtle nice and healthy. So that does not happen. They're slowly making sure a huge amount of minions are crashing into the turret. Gives more time for a little bit of that harass. Wild Turtle loves to do that in between his shots. Yeah, and it's really hard to push a Maokai out of the lane here, especially when you're an AD carry and a support. The amount of passive auto attacks you can get it is huge. <laughs> what Turtle is doing very well in this Trist matchup this time, though, is making sure to tag balls with the healing reduction every time he's under the turret, which in turn is helping harass him out. I mean, he's already teleported yeah. back into the lane, and he's been taken below half. So that is actually a vulnerability to a turret dive if they get him a little bit lower. And Wild Turtle's play within that is such a mind game, because that's ticking damage, so the turret's always going to want to hit you. He's doing a great job at microing in and out of where that's aggroing him to. Beautiful play so far, like we said. It's actually pretty standard for what TSM and Cloud9 are bringing out in this best of five series, but amazing. He's itching. This is so similar to game one. The jungle pathing has been nearly identical. The lane matchups That's true. have been so close. The only thing that differed is Dyrus was more passive and did not give up the first blood. Slower game from high. He is a driving force being pretty much the only voice you will hear on Cloud9's comp. So to give him a slower start will for surely help in the rest of the game. Good push towards the bottom lane still. Looks like jungle, pr jungle pressure from Meteos towards the Wraith camp. We've seen him come over that wall quite a bit, but Bjergsen's going to be backing here to keep himself safe. Yeah, this game is very close to be at. I'm looking towards uh, kind of the team fights, I think it's again going to be very much about High trying to split push this game. Hmm. He's been able to shut down Dyrus in the past in the split push, and that's what they're going for again, which is why in the early game here, Cloud9 wants to shut Dyrus down. And look at the soul lane presence of Sneaky. That's uh, not the cleanest of ganks right there. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, look at all the turret shots. They're gonna try and keep him at bay and they will be able to for Hai to get up here. Little tough. He's pretty much dead. They're gonna give Hai this kill. That's the death mark. First blood goes down. Very nicely done. That's what it costs though. That's what it costs indeed. Dragon's gonna go down to team solo mid. So Hai does go ahead and get that first blood again, but there is an instant trade back as there was not last time. TSM's gonna pick up this dragon and have the complete timer. And no wards here from Cloud9. They'll kill the turret, they give up the dragon, they get the first blood. It is very much a trade here, but it's a trade for the power of Dyrus. In games when Dyrus hasn't succeeded against Cloud9, Cloud9 generally wins. In games where High succeeds for Cloud9, they generally win. So if we're thinking about the global gold versus the individual strength, having strength on High is better than having a little bit of strength on the other four members of TSM that aren't Dyrus. He's got the Cutlass already. Looks to be building quite fast. Could have that 20 minute Blade of the Rune King, or even sub rather. The jump out from Wild Turtle signifies a back from the lane of Team Solo Mid. They're happy with the amount of gold they have. It's going to be that phage coming out from Sneaky. The lane protection and safety here. They're going to go ahead and get him actually back down to the bottom lane since that top turret's taken out. So go ahead and 
Spread out the pressure. Spike upgrade coming in from Amazing. Yeah, once again, trying to get that added spray from the Void Spikes. Feels a little bit sad that his red was stolen away. Doesn't look like they're going to be able to get a counter steal, so that's just a nice little experience that Amazing will be able to gain onto Meteos. The wards are definitely helping. Kobe talked about that a little bit the other day. You have the wards to see them coming in. Your sweepers are going to be more effective, and Meteos has hit quite a few with that. So at least hopefully he can clear his jungle up now for later. And very, very sneaky. Trying to come in, Lemonation and locking down on Wild Turtle, but he gets out safe. So everybody's definitely playing with their hard hat on this game. A little bit less engagement as we've seen already. And we were talking about the potential item build of Bjergsen earlier in the game. He's giving High the utmost respect right now to rush the Seekers while still going Dorans, putting himself in a little bit of a mana hole, but he's still been able to farm quite well despite not having an early mana item outside the Dorans ring. Now he's going Chalice, so he might end up going Athene Zanyas as his first two items. A defensive Ori build more so than one to blow people up. Right, talking about seeing that tier earlier, but a little more maybe pressure that he's feeling. Great damage from Dyrus. Eight to six in that top lane. Yeah, that's Take the cost control. of what Cloud9 has done there. Sacrificing the early game of balls for the early game of Sneaky. And now Dyrus is going to try and take a little bit of advantage here. If he can use this level advantage, it'll be absolutely critical for TSM success. Oh, this could be big. Amazing was kind of seeing a counter gank in the top lane, but they're all towards the bottom. Cloud9 is going to be taking control of the turret. Wild Turtle must wipe back off. They see something's not right on the map. Yeah, they're not really fighting each other. They're just splitting mm -hmm. where they're keeping their people. <laughs> Cloud9, when they had everyone top, TSM was bottom, and they just swapped it around right now. Uh, this time, TSM, though, grouping mid, which is the smarter adaptation. This mid turret is the most valuable. It looks like it's going to go down quite fast. TSM did this last time. Being able to open up the middle of the map, get the wards out, and start controlling the rest of it really helped them. Nice bubble to go out and protect against this bit of a push they have in the mid lane, but bottom turret's prepped and warmed up by Cloud9. Dyrus should have the top one as well to trade back on that. We'll see if this strategy pays off. Mm -hmm. Trying to get Cogmaw so much solo time. He does have very powerful skills, so getting a few extra levels on the AD carry can be important. But they're giving up a lot of map control for this. Losing the middle turret, losing the dragon. We'll make it difficult to create plays for Cloud9. Looks so like can stay safe. A little bit of a poke from Sneaky to get the vision out. No scrying orb for him just yet. You can see that on quite a few Kog'Maw's. Wild Turtle loves to be grabbing that in his build when he can. Blue buffs in the mid lane. Looks like he's going to keep both these guys safe and at bay from each other. 97 or 99 to 107 in that lane. Not too bad. Dyrus actually did not decide to get this turret down. He goes ahead and hangs out. Still has a lane to be pushing. 99 to 58. Pretty crazy yeah. in that lane. The biggest edge in the game for sure. Rod of Ages will be what Balls needs to become relevant. However long Balls can stall out that lane, the better it is for Cloud9. Dyrus needs to punish this. He's doing his damnedest. Glitter Lance every time he's got it up to make sure it's in the wave, and he's picking his own minions to even add extra harass and stop balls from back, as we saw previously. Dyrus still giving him rune, though. Room every time he has the chance. Going back to buy instantly. Push the lane and come back. It's easy he stays this time, but we've actually seen him kind of do that strategy before. Push it, back, buy. Push it, back, and buy. Big game of cat and mouse here. Yeah, you could say that. Just trying to run away. Uh, deep ward coverage from Cloud9 and TSM has been up, but I feel like it's going to drop shortly. That's why Dyrus is so confident pushing that wave, is because they have the two wards in the blue buff of Cloud9. Mm -hmm. so nice job there to finish off the turret. Let's see, most of the sweepers are down, so it's actually Cloud9 just not finding these. Those wards are really well placed by Team Solo Mid. Not being able to act on them too soon. They will in 30 seconds. Don't have too much on Dragon right now. The pink wards are definitely on the backside for Cloud9. But they don't have too much vision of the Dragon other than a regular vision. Just sit in the pit. Push to the mid lane, hoping to prep TSM for this Dragon. See him peel off and head back. 
far as itemization breakpoints, mm -hmm. the Blade of the Rune King is pretty massive for high, but as is the Athenes for Dyrus. The fact that Bjergsen's went for multiple components means he's a little weaker than high right now. But the combined shielding should still be enough to make it so high's ultimate can't be that large. I would love to get level 11 before this fight for a more powerful ultimate. Yeah, it is TSM who's kind of controlling this spot, though. Should actually bring him quite close to getting that level that he requires. Medio is trying to get his red buff here, buying more time. Down towards Sneaky, oh, what a sneaky. rotation. We're gonna have the teleport coming in from Balls, actually right on top for the crowd control. Lemon Nation there saying, stand behind me. And he actually gets the shield broken out by the Buster shot coming in from Wild Turtle. They're gonna back off towards the Dragon now. Jap, looks like we're gonna get our first good fight out of this game, possibly. Everybody's a little wary about it though. They yep. know what the momentum can do. Well, at the moment, the teleport advantage would lay with Dyrus, but he's not in a split push position, so. Mm. It doesn't really matter. We could see a fight very shortly, especially now the ball's getting a little bit low. This is where Cloud9 loves to fight every time. Lemonation throws it down, but the team may not be on the same page. High was way far away. A shockwave coming in from Bjergsen. Good heal onto Sneaky, and they're gonna keep themselves safe here. High still waiting to use that death mark. Wild Turtle can easily jump away so he can keep himself in a dangerous spot on the front. But what a back and forth. Neither team really wanting to commit hard to that fight. Yeah, like such a difficult corridor to navigate right there. Both teams taken very low from the fight and too scared to continue on to the Dragon. So nice zoning there by both teams from Bjergsen's Shockwave yeah. to the Tidal Wave that was sent out by Lustboy. So they both live to fight another day and usually with these teams that means right away. Yeah, they'll... The question will be who used both more ultimates and who is weaker heading into the next fight. Dyrus, Bjergsen, and Lustboy. All down ultimates. The only disengaged TSM would have left would be Wild Turtles. Yep. Knock away on Trist. Whereas Cloud9 is sitting on everything save for Lemonation. So they do hold the edge here. And this is that teleport edge from Dyrus. He would teleport in if they wanted to fight. But just the, the ultimate discrepancy and the loss of vision is going to grant Cloud9 this dragon. Nicely down by Cloud9, playing the bit of game of cat and mouse. Kind of mentioned that if TSM needed to stay risk averse, it'd be at Dragons. So they give up that one. There's a one of two in the game. So not too shabby. Global Gold coming in all the way around. Towards this late game, going to be definitely helpful. Sneaky can be grabbing this blue that High won't need. So that'll be a huge boon for them if they can keep giving Kogma that blue buff. Right now he's in the bottom lane, so we won't see it just yet, but some Cloud9 definitely has to look forward to. High, clearing out some wards, he will be able to stay safe, but we've got Amazing and Lust Boy. Roman numbers right now trying to ward up, keep the map clear. Still an incredibly close game. These teams definitely poised to give us a great series. Ooh! Meteos ends up getting that blue buff. It's not a huge deal because Zed only minorly benefits from it, but they were definitely trying to pass that off on a high. And Meteos ended up taking it. So we're only 17 minutes in. No real lead coming in for either team. And definitely a slower turret game as well. Cloud9 and TSM kind of putting the brakes on themselves. While Turtle farming, and why not? We have Trist, we have the Kog'Ma. They are going to be farming up for that late game. Very, 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 scary. getting the pressure in here, very interesting. Turtle is kind of playing fearless this game with Lost Boy on his side, and they're going to go ahead and do a little clearing of their own. Kha'Zix on the back side. Bjergsen starting to rotate up as well, and look at all these wards Team Solo mid has around Baron, probably trying to force a fight and take a turret. Right now it's going to be Bjergsen in mid lane though. Oh, well he's got a barrier and a lot of defensive capabilities. He's going to have to use all of them right there, and, and he gets be the Wild Grove. Pulls all the way back to the Death Mark Shadow. Gets himself to safety. The bubble locks up both Lemon Nation and High. But he gets to clear the distance and get back home. It was effectively a 3v5 once TSM collapsed. So Cloud9 pulling that away. TSM had to burn a lot yeah. just to stop High from executing Bjergsen. Now the question will be how well Cloud9 can collapse down here to defend this middle interior turret. But not the Living Shadow to try and clear Wave Sneaky with the Triforce finish, trying to get that Power Spike into effect, and he does! He starts knocking down health bars, the Glacial Fisher just misses, and that's the disengage. No Tidal Wave needed, yeah. they still have that. I'd say poor ultimate right there from Lemon Nation, just burning one Flash, right. but you can see the power of Sneaky coming in with Trinity Force on Kog'Maw. 
well ahead power-wise to Wild Turtle. That's one thing Cloud9 does not hesitate when they get those spikes. They will throw it right at you, even trying to harass them down. Cloud9's looking to get a turret here and set pieces in position to get even more. Give Cloud9 an inch and they will take a mile. Yeah, he's trying to disrupt these recalls for as long as possible, but mm -hmm. just outside of the range there is Bjergsen. Still, it's going to be very difficult if TSM wants to save their middle turret. Yeah, great job by High as well, stopping Dyrus from getting the bottom turret. Pushes him back as they even start to initiate a split push as they start taking down the mid turret. Uh, Dyrus is forced back all the way, probably farm some camps up as he waits for High to push that lane in. Only going to get a small push and then rejoin with the team. We saw him doing this last time. The power that the rest of TSM brings to the fight sometimes needs High as well to counteract that. You're absolutely right. With 66% of that fan vote going over to TSM, Ooh. I'd still put this game a lot closer to 50-50 based on the way these teams are playing. It'll be a lot about Wild Turtle's farm level. If you can get a few kills in these team fights, it'll be absolutely critical because of all the protection TSM can offer him. But at the moment, Sneaky is just so above and beyond that power level. If Cloud9 can gain a five to 10,000 gold lead in the next 15 minutes, could very well just be the game down to the bottom lane. Dyrus looks pretty calm on the comms at this point. I'm surprised it's been so slow to come into this game. Mm -hmm. Both teams are absolutely playing risk averse so far back. They have the vision too to kind of be doing things to get themselves into troublesome spot, go put some more wards down, but nobody's forcing anything. They're expecting somebody else to do something. Yeah, both teams have some really solid late game elements to their team. Yeah. And it's also generally been Cloud9 with their positioning and their willingness to give up certain things that have been keeping this a low kill game. I think TSM is very willing to fight. It's just Cloud9's not presenting them with right. fightable opportunities. It's a pretty strong wild turn there. No armor yet built up by Balls. He's got a long way home actually. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Just helped him. A little give and go there with himself. Gets out balls to the outside of that fight. No teleport, possibly. No, there is a teleport up, so maybe that's why he was trying to get himself away. He'll be in the bottom lane. Trying to see what Cloud9 can continue to do in this game. Right now, they're only up 200 gold. 40 seconds left on the dragon. Nothing gonna happen. I was looking at High's Ignite. It did just come off, but he wasn't able to get it off with the death mark. I figured maybe waiting for that because every time he has death mark somebody, they get a million shields and they live. So the yep. Ignite needs to be on there. Just for that little bit of extra damage. It's still gonna be very difficult for High to kill anyone. It, at the best, yeah. The best case scenario is that High actually draws attention to himself, burns a lot of shields, and allows Sneaky to kill the targets that he wants to kill. That's true. Right. We still have the living artillery you're looking for. This huge Kogma. Red buff on as well to enable a little more catch. The rest of the team want to play off this. And Cloud9. Vision Boy, control yep. at Dragon Pit is so in the hands of Cloud9 right now. But TSM looks willing to just run straight at them. Lemon takes so much damage. Lemon's going to go down before the fight even starts here. The last heal doesn't get the kill. It's going to be Meteos picking up the dragon, and they need to now back out of this. Great job grabbing the dragon, and they save face without losing Lemon Nation. Wow. Ash is burned, but they're all right. Again, just so much disengage. Or maybe even TSM just having a pretty big lack of solid initiation is allowing Cloud9 to run away from most of these fights. Really appreciate the Kog'Maw pick in this context. There's not much on TSM that can actively punish him. If they can burn his flash, they can zone him out with shockwaves from Bjergsen. But maybe even not, because at this point, uh, because of the threat of the Zed, oftentimes the Protect will keep the ball in TSM, and if they extend it, it creates a massive vulnerability for TSM. So Sneaky is kind of free to just rain damage on TSM. Yep. It's one of the main reasons we've only had one kill in 23 minutes, is because in order for the TSM composition to become aggressive, they become incredibly vulnerable to Cloud9. So it's kind of on Cloud9 to initiate yeah. uh, into TSM's defenses. And unless they're willing to do that, they're just going to have to keep gaining these micro advantages off of Dragon every six minutes. Well, it's coming into play now that they can have balls in the bottom lane with a teleport, and they're starting to feed Sneaky that blue buff. It's going to help tremendously. 
few shots over to high, trying to back him off in the mid lane, kind of destroying this initiation. They would have been able to close it from the side on. TSM doing the right things, and they say, you know what, we need to back up, clear these wards, and then we'll feel a little bit more comfortable about pushing up. And it does seem like TSM is getting a little antsy about trying to find fights. You can see they are capable of burning flashes, and if they catch Cloud9 a really long way away from their base or their nearest turret, they have a big move speed advantage with the Ori, Nami, and yeah. Lulu just to chase Cloud9 down. It's just Cloud9 has been playing relatively close to their turrets. With three turrets down, and with Cloud9 trying to get on the offensive, the potential for fights only increases. Getting everything they can. Pink Ward's going down onto the Baron Pit. Cloud9 back to the bottom lane, balls and high. Really trading off the split push to this lane. Not having a problem with it either. Dyrus has not yet been able to take down this turret. Cloud9 starting to gain a little bit of ground, spreading it about 700 or 600 gold. Not too shabby. But still, looking for those initiations. We said it would be hard for both teams, so it's going to be the ward game that really pays off. And that's what Cloud9 is about to play. Even then, though, they don't have the people in position. That could just be a bait. Whoa! A bait indeed. There's nothing on the other side of the wall. The Itsy Bitsy Spider comes back down the spout and absolutely goes down. Good collapse there by TSM. They had the move speed to get in range. Whoa, whoa, but, whoa. oh dear! Oh, the Caustic Spittle shredding through Wild Turtle there, along with the Living Artilleries. Very, very close for him to go down. Blade of the Rune King finished up on Sneaky, too. 25 minutes in, putting out some big power. You do not want to tango with Sneaky right now. With those two items, doesn't even get his Blade of the Rune King active off. Wild Turtle realized very early on that he wouldn't win that trade. Oh, Sneaky also has to be careful himself, though that fade given him. If they use all their moose movement, speed, they could charge there, but they would have had to go in blind. That's true. They don't have very deep vision coverage because Sneaky is playing so aggressive. Oh, my word. What a nuisance. Starting to play on the minds of TSM for sure, one after the other. That just becomes super annoying. You want to come out and take down that Void Puppy immediately now. See if it gets TSM into trouble. Dyrus keeping it safe, suspecting that there may be a little bit more, maybe with the behavior of how High was playing there. And he does see Elimination coming off on the side. The whole team is there, and Sneaky is getting every blue now. Yep, flash right off the bat there from Dyrus. He's much more respectful of High Zed in this game than in the first. Making sure to not yeah. leave any openings. Already having a Seeker's Arm Guard as well. The last time he was trying to rush his death cap instead of building a little bit of armor itemization. So this time, trying to avoid those assassinations. Cloud9 still just trying to get vision, but as we've seen, both these teams very cautious to make an over-aggressive move, especially when you get this late into a game. Yeah. An over-aggressive move will probably lead to Baron. You can't fall short on anything. If you do, that could absolutely mean your base. Amazing trying to stop everything from being stolen from the jungle. But they pretty much cannot get too much out of it. Just looking around at what the core and finished items now for spikes. And not much has changed for Team Solo Mid. Dyra still trying to put together a Zanya of his own for a little bit more fight chaos and to cause Cloud9 to have to refocus. A lot of their crowd control can be used instantly and then TSM's free to run to the fight. So if that first guy can stay alive, they have a better chance. All the buffs. The farming just continues. Uh, taking a look at the gold just to see where the power is falling on these teams. There's nearly 10,000 gold on a sneaky. He was about 1,000 ahead of Wild Turtle. And that discrepancy is made up between the Maokai and the Lulu. So if the teleport game is played and Balls and Dyrus are actually late to team fights, that's what Cloud9 would prefer. Cloud9 is not worried to put themselves in a dangerous spot here, but TSM is trying to regroup and figure out how to get that spread out into a big death ball. A lot of it is about this dragon positioning. The danger of trying to death ball for TSM right here is the Zed will provide a lot of AoE damage. It's and true. Sneaky also can throw in a bunch of spells. That's a critical mistake. Unfortunate play there. They do throw the ball on, trying to get a shockwave down. Wild Turtle's on the outside. He gets death marked down. They're able to focus whoever they want after that. No real crowd control needed on this fight. Ball's taking a bit of 
damage as he tries to initiate for the team, but they realize the front line needs to go to the backside. We're going for Dragon now. Cloud Nine's going to clear it out the pit, take it themselves. I'm not sure what prompted Dyrus' Zanyas right there. I'd have to see it again, whether it was just a pure misclick or whether he thought he saw something that was going to catch him out. But either way, that positional jump right there creates a massive vulnerability, and Cloud Nine's able to jump on it. Balls, though, teleports in for not much of a catch. He teleports in immediately. It looks like they might want to try to get Baron off of this if they can stop enough people. No mana, not being able to use the ult. Cloud9 can easily just take this, this one. This is hyper aggressive right now. The Shockwave is still available. Teleport is still available on Dyrus as well. Ball's trying to zone out as best he can. He's doing a great job, but trying I feel like TSM's going to collapse. Oh, they blew him up. Hi got out. Amazing can't do anything. They have no smite to try in this. Nothing to get this away from Meteos, and they are going to be able to take down Baron right from Dragon to Baron. They're still going. This teleport in from Balls created so much chaos, and Cloud9 is not stopping. Wow, so just one missed step there by TSM, and Cloud9 pounces on them. Yep. They were waiting for their moment. The Zed from High gives them the confidence to jump over and blow up Amazing, and they're going to continue this offensive. They will not give up once they get a little bit. This next turret going down quite easily. That Triforce helping out quite a bit. And it looks like they are going to be out and back to buy. A lot finished out on these. Let's see this one more time. Yeah, it was just a fact the Balls was zoning out. High could shadow over the wall. And Kha'Zix is too squishy. Once they had the lockdown, he could go on top of them. At that point, there's no emphasis for Dyrus to teleport in because the follow couldn't arrive for the rest of the team. It was a really smart move there for Cloud9 to know that even just the one kill was enough for them to be able to take Baron. Because we we're really late into the game, and they could kill it quickly. Absolutely. Sneaky. He's having a little bit of cash off of this if he has not gone back yet. 2.6 thousand Sneaky's waiting to spend right now. You can see him backing on the screen. That'll be quite nice for him. It'll get some more damage under the belt. BF Sword, just sell something out. I don't need that potion. Let's get some more damage. He'll be coming into the game very big now. Wild Turtle's only looking at that one death. And he's trying to build up a scepter after that. Yeah, I just had another look at the Dyra Zanyas that led to all of that. Mm. And there were no immediate skill shots coming in to kill him. He either was trying to drink a health potion or just Zanya at the wrong moment. But that was a huge mistake. Not having that spell created all of this advantage for Cloud9. Maybe Lemonation hitting a Glacial Fisher, But still, it looks like they could have dodged that even without a Zanyas. Yeah. A lot of things to look at in that fight again. Maybe on the Analyst desk. Right now, the game in the mid lane for Cloud9. 31 minutes in, 3-1 to one on the scoreboard. And Jad, they've got a 5,000 gold lead that just kind of surmounted out of nowhere. It came yeah. from that Dragon and Baron, but it was very close before that. Dragon and Baron, two kills. Now, falls with the Bantiesville completed, working yeah. on his Frozen Heart. Going to try to become a menace for Wild Turtle. They really need a strong tank to deal with the Farm Trist at the end of the game. If that doesn't happen, Cloud9 would have no chance here. Uh, high trying to get strong enough to take people out. A lot of respect being given to him. You can see TSM building two Zonya's Hourglasses. Yep. It also delays their death caps, however, which decreases their amount of threat onto Cloud9. One of the benefits of having a strong Zed player on your team. Still a blue buff on Sneaky. He's feeling very good. Baron surrounding the team as High's going to be able to take down the turret by himself. You can just see Lemon and Balls hovering around Sneaky the entire time. It's like, we need to protect this guy right here. This guy. And the question will be how well can they clear these waves, basically. Uh, we may end up seeing Cloud9 going all the way around for a, mm -hmm. the final utter turret, but they're getting a decent amount of work done on that middle turret. They're going to try this 4-1 split push a while longer. Why not? TSM can't really answer back to too much of it. High on the bottom side, still has his actives and Yomu's ready, so he can easily take somebody on 1v1. Using the sh uh, shadow just to make sure nobody's in too much of a dangerous position. That'll be the death mark, but that will also... Oh no, he saves himself with the flash wild growth on that one. It's going to be a turnaround here. He's already taken the death mark shadow, so he's to safety. Balls taking quite a bit of damage under that turret, but middle has gone down in that fiasco. TSM losing a bit of ground just to take down Maokai. A really nice turnaround there by TSM to actually take down the tank from Cloud9, but that's because Cloud9 wasn't actually fighting that. Sneaky was all the while just using the free time on the mid-tier turret, and TSM's base has basically been cracked. Yeah, they can just go around to the top side now. A good push on every lane 
they've preemptively set up is really putting them in a position to keep this push going. No backing necessary. Balls can and should be able to teleport with that cooldown in, so Cloud9 could formulate something here. 317 CS on both Zed and Kogma right now. You can see who the threats are for this Cloud9 team. Doing their best to diversify, but those are two of the highest damaging champions in the game. If you're going to run a two-threat team, those are two of the best to have. See this again. Yeah, I mean, he poked game Dyrus trips. down just that long. Immediately, he burns the Zhonyas, so he's thinking, all right. Does he actually go back? He pops his Ghost Blade just to take everything. Elimination with a great reactive shield onto the Nami. That was nice, too. High grab the exhaust out of that. Yeah, Balls was just in a little bit too far for the defensive and it allowed the collapse from TSM. Even so, you can see what a distraction that was. It was a huge threat. If I kills Dyrus, the turrets fall for sure. Maybe even two inhibitors. Yeah. So TSM was forced to go back down that way. Check this out. Hi saying, yeah, magic damage. Maw of Malmordius. Gonna bring that out here in the playoffs. It looks like it's gonna help. And the Hex Drinker have kept people alive through many early game attacks. So even more so as he puts damage on that item. Cloud9 now doing a dragon without any problem as they should. This side of the map is completely theirs. TSM has good wards on their own side to create opportunities for themselves. Cloud9 chooses to walk through that minefield, but they've got to hit it right. Cloud9 is so powerful right now. Looking at 7,000 gold ahead. TSM still doing their best to hang on. The game is not completely broke yet, no. but it is very close to doing so. They would love a little bit more farm so Darius and Bjorks can get death caps. At the moment, though, they are prone to getting pushed around by Cloud9. Cloud9 wants the fight now. Ooh, amazing. Actually jumps it after high lands. Very nicely timed there. Doesn't actually bring him over with the team for that AoE damage. Death Mark is down. Might want to wait for that before they continue to fight here. Maelstrom is also down for balls, so this could be a very tricky back and forth. TSM has a great window to fight here. You can just see how aggressive Sneaky is. He's the front line, which means he gets caught up by the Tidal Wave. Oh, just so close from getting the inhibitor down. They want to use the Tidal Wave to shut everything down. Dyrus using Wild Growth. So much focus onto him. Can they come from the back side here? Bjergsen not being able to throw the ball in for a good shock wave. There's one. It pulls him against the wall. The dissonance strikes through elimination as well. Turtle to get the reset. He gets one. Flashes forward. Then he jumps. He's going to try to get more. The heal's already been used, and they get locked down around the wall. A spectacular shockwave right there by Bjergsen to turn the fight. But once again, it's because Cloud9's main focus was on the inhibitor right there. Yes, Dyrus did a great job of pulling him in with Johnny's, but TSM's base takes another hit. Yep. Cloud9 always coming up with a little bit of what they want while making it look good for their opponents. Yeah. See this again. The Baron's going to be huge right here, but you can see Dyrus obviously having to get burned out. Meteos, though, goes to finish the turret. Whether or not he's in the fight may have actually ended up turning that one a decent way. Zhonya's from Dyrus. That time he had the right moment. You could just see that shockwave completely obliterating him, and if not for a nice stun there by Meteos, it may have just been cursed. Luckily, uh, Cloud9 was able to respawn in time to defend that Baron, but it was actually really close. Does not go down, and that means we are going to get another fight. Alts are just coming off a cooldown for some of them. Must boy, that tidal wave is huge for TSM. That's one of the main reasons he uses it for these disengages. I feel like this isn't going to be so much about Cloud9 forcing Baron, but Cloud9 forcing the mid lane, which could then give them control of Baron. Right now they have the wow. cutoff position on TSM, and those super minions will push down unless TSM forces a full-time defender. Cloud9 taking their, their sweet time, though, because there is a lot of minions in the bot lane. They have the wards to know exactly what's going on right now. They slowly walk it down mid, as you were saying. No Baron attempt just yet. Both teams are privy of its knowledge for when it's going to be going down. But I think Cloud9 is going to try to force this, possibly just as that whole bush control. Wait for TSM to just walk right in. They pull themselves out of the jungle. So many options for them. Sweepers are not up yet, at least for balls. He can get some clearing out. The pink ward's gonna help. Not for long. As was seen in the last fight, though, Cloud9 has to respect the reset potential of that TSM team. A few more, one more kill may have actually granted TSM the game, but Balls does get a catch on Turtle. He's going to try and tank as much as possible. Shockwave not that effective, and the Tidal Wave is blocked. This fight is already spread out, Jad. A lot of back and forth as they reconsider. Now the walls separate TSM. 
And we're going to see High on the backside. He comes in, tries to go down on Amazing. He's forced to jump out of the fight. This seems like Cloud9's running amok in TSM's jungle. You mentioned that spread out fight, and that is what Zed lives for. High now into it. There's the Sanyas. They're going to start crushing down the health bars of Team Solo mid. There's the living artillery. They cannot get vision on it, but he's going to keep chasing. Double kill from High on the other side of the fight. With the inhibitor already down and Bjergsen on the run, this is probably game right here. Ace and an open inhibitor. There's the clean finish. Nobody down for Cloud9. The ace indeed as the crowd is cheering. Cloud9 coming out hard in game three after a very back and forth beginning. The Nexus turns to drop. 39 minutes into the game, Cloud9 take game three. The difference a game makes. High was 197 in game two, 601 here in game three, and he gives Cloud9 a 2 1 advantage in this best of five. Fantastic play coming out from Cloud9. They find their bearings once again after Team Solo mid knocks them down a bit, but this is not over yet. Going into game four now, TSM will be back on blue, be able to prioritize a pick, which was very helpful last game. And we'll see if they can bring us to a game five. A lot is on the line here, Jack. Game yeah. point and Cloud9. Yes, they lost a, lost a playoff match, but they're looking to take the finals again. You can see TSM here looking a little more attentive than after the game one loss. Maybe a bit more struggle in this one because they were so close for so long and losing a low kill game like that can sometimes be the most frustrating thing because it feels like there's nothing you could have done about it. Uh, that time though, High just got going and going. The final team fight was a big positional error. You can see Loco talking with their shot caller Bjergsen right now about just what went wrong. I definitely had some nice isolations in that last fight. Yeah. They always were giving TSM something else to think about, whether it was high in the bottom lane or, or balls in the bottom lane on Maokai. They always had somebody split pushing. And then there's power to disengage if it's high split pushing or the power to engage if it's balls split pushing. Yeah, very tricky game right there. You know, 39 minutes, only eight kills to four. Definitely the most subdued game we have played probably all playoffs. Yet, sometimes when there's this much on the line and they've played each other this many times, TSM could just never find those initiations. They right. didn't have necessarily the team to get initiations with, and Cloud9 just starved them out. Kog'Maw, very effective against Trist. Even though he was only 1-0-2, the presence that Sneaky had in all these yeah. fights, it's like he was just pushing TSM around the map. TSM just couldn't get the fight. The Zanya is really coming out big in a few instances, a few errors, but with the amount of HP that Balls had going into the fights, the Zanyas were kind of just outweighed. And then they said, all right, let's kill him. Needed to be hit earlier. From where inside on this, obviously we've got our analyst desk standing by to break down Cloud Nine's second series win. Thanks, guys. Jat hit on it. Subdued game. I want to delve into that a little bit because I'm not entirely sure why it was so lackluster in the early minutes of the game. Everybody's kind of trying to scale up. They just had vision control of the areas and the impact of the junglers just, they were kind of just outplaying each other. It was like, we're just going to roam around. We're going to have some conflicts, but there was never really a big engaged team fight that somebody forced out. And a lot of that is TSM didn't have engaged tools until they were around Dragon and could get a choke point with Orianna. How much of that too is the fact that the series is 1-1 so both teams not wanting to give up that advantage and you know pushing it to series point um i guess both teams could be kind of in the mindset of okay i don't want to screw up but um i don't know they might just be tired mentally fatigued from the two games already which have been pretty action-packed and of course we did see tsm give that zed back to high which He's illustrated he has confidence and, you know, the playmaking abilities on that champion to cu to bounce back from a not-so-great game in the second game. Yeah, the exact same bans from Cloud9 and the first pick from Game 1, which was so successful th from them before, they just went back to an old strategy there. And Hai, you know, he really looks back to form this playoffs. We talked about it. His regular season wasn't that fantastic. Now that the meta's kind of back in this assassin area, he's really flourishing on things like Yasuo, which which he didn't have a great game on, but his Zed looks on point, and I think it needs to be banned on red side every time. I want to point out that he got like rolling this game the exact same way he got in the first game, which was he went top and he got a kill yeah. on Dyrus without using either summoner spell. Uh, yeah, that's definitely helpful when you're playing an assassin like Zed. This time, though, we did see Bjergsen hop onto the Orianna as opposed to the Fizz, and I 
even with the loss, I do feel like that worked out a bit better for him. Was that kind of what you think he should have gone for there, Pobother? Um, in terms of the mid pick, Oriana was fine. But the problem was that they have this super supportive um, team comp with Oriana Lulu, and Turtle was constantly getting in like these really weird positions. Like that last fight, he rocket jumped into the Maokai and then just pretty much got killed by Zed instantly. And then, of course, Zyrene, you pointed out that they didn't have a ton of engage opportunities, and Cloud9 was able to take advantage of that by really stalling out for the engagement they wanted. And we are going to actually take a quick look at that replay of the misclicked Zonias there from Dyrus 28 minutes into the game. Zyrene, talk to me a little bit about maybe what, what was the impetus for this, and you know, perhaps it just is a misclick. I think it's a misclick. There's no reason for him to Zanya's there. There was no skill shots coming in on him. It could be nerves. It could be the fact that he had bought it just a couple minutes ago and hadn't put it on the key that he was expecting. So we're going to roll it out here. And you know, I don't want to belabor it too much, but he was just in a bad position and he ends up hitting it. And yeah, maybe meant to hit a potion. Maybe it could have been a masterful bait by Dyrus that didn't go the right way. But regardless, it tells Cloud9 that they get to go in Wild Turtle Ends up getting popped there. Man, Dyrone tearing this family apart. Well, it just kind of also illustrates how much this game can change on the on a dime. I've never seen a single misplay like that affect a game that's been so even before. Because that ended up giving them Dragon, gives the Baron. That's what they they ended up rotating to right after that. And Cloud9, they got that just big gold lead for themselves, but it's still very low in kills, very low contact game. And then, of course, Poe Belter, just as a player who's played in high-pressure situations, and uh, I will call you out for the one time that you actually flashed a wall, and Zonia's... Yeah. Wh when that happens in a game, though, how does that affect your mentality as a player, just making, you know, an honest mistake like that? Um, well, when that happened, I did the exact same thing versus Curse, like, in the middle of the split. It just... It, it actually really shattered my mentality. Like, I thought we were going to lose the game off that play. Like, luckily, we were still able to win, but... I was just like really on tilt. I was quiet and I didn't play as well. Yeah, and when I was talking about how it's a low contact game, just going back to my point because I didn't actually completely close it out. I'm sorry about that. Because it's such a low contact game in kills, the objectives are worth even more because that's where you're going to get your advantages. Because Cloud9, they don't have any wave clear aside from Zed using his shadow and just doing that, but Orianna has more. So it's more of a wave, wave clear, stall it out on... Cloud9, or TSM side, and then look for Cloud9 to engage on you. But Cloud9 was looking for the engages that don't happen always under turret. They're looking for the dragon fights. So it was always kind of like seven minutes, six minutes. We'll see every dragon fight, every baron fight, back and forth. And that's where the action was going to originate. But you had to get vision control first. So teams were that didn't have the vision would just back off, say you can have it this time, we'll come back for it. So I think the objective trading really shows how on level these two teams are with each other. And of course, Cloud9 then decided to use their engage opportunities throughout the rest of the game to pick up that victory. We're going to jump to the final team fight, the ace that secures the victory for them. We're going to pull that up onto your screen here. And Poe Belter, I'm going to have you walk us through this one. So this was, uh, we can roll the clip. This was the fight I was talking about where Turtle jumps in and ends up getting caught out by Zed. He gets rooted, Zed is coming in and eventually catches up with his shadow jump. So the fight is like pretty much a 4v5 instantly. The Oriole doesn't deal that much damage because of the locket. And then from here, they're so split up. Zed picks off Tristana. Uh, Kha'Zix is trying to help. And it just puts them all in such a bad position. Maokai gets a catch on Lust Boy. And from here, they're just picking them off. Because the assassinate at the very beginning of the fight, that just already spells the game. Yeah, it was off the back of a crit, too. And the only crit item he had in his inventory was Yomu's Ghost Blade. And it was such an incredibly bold jump in there by Tristana. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what was going through his head there to jump in towards a Maokai. It's Wild Turtle. Well, yeah, and that was going to be my question, is that he is known for making some of those aggressive plays like that, whose job is it on the team to kind of temper that for him and, and reel, reel him in? Because sometimes it pays dividends when he, when he goes aggressively, but at other times it can be the catalyst for an entirely lost team fight. Uh, it's kind of a toss-up there. Bjergsen is the shot caller of the team. Amazing is in charge of the ganks in the early game. But Lustboy, his lane partner, you know, he moderates him through the lane, so Wild Turtle really needs to check himself there. I really think that it needs to be his decision-making, or at least his communication with the team saying, I'm going here, or at least getting feedback and saying, should I go? 
I really think that's the problem there. Communication is very key. He just, I think he just kind of went for a risky play there. They didn't have any vision on Baron or the surrounding area, so I think he assumed that the four other members on TSM were, I mean, the four other members on C9 were on Baron and that Balls was just out of position, so he went in to pick him off, but that wasn't the case and he just got punished so hard for it. Illustrating the importance of vision. Well, TSM is currently locking down their game plan going into game four, so what exactly is it that they need to be discussing right now? What are going to be the key factors in coming out with the victory? I think just don't get down on yourself, Dyrus, for the Zonia's play. I think that's a really big one. And also, their pick bans, what they're going to do about the Zed and Syndra now. Um, I think that they'll just lean to comfort picks. Well, it's either they're going to lean to their comfort picks or they're going to just do something crazy because they feel like they have no hope. So. I'd like to see something crazy. <laughs> well, we'll find out. Don't touch that mouse. Cloud9 are just one win away from becoming our summer split champions. When we come back, it's on to game four of Team Solo Mid versus Cloud9. Our championship Monday continues in three and a half. Unfortunate play there. They do throw the ball on, trying to get a shockwave down. Wild Turtles on the outside. He gets death mark down. The Erickson not being able to throw the ball in for a good shockwave. There's one. It pulls him against the wall. The dissonance strikes through elimination as well. You mentioned that spread out fight, and that is what Zed lives for. High now into it. There's the Zanyas. They're going to start crushing down the health bar as the team solo mid.